Control that Christ hath regarded my helpless state and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well. Hi, 8th Street Church. Welcome to worship together on this fifth Sunday of the season of Lent. We are glad to be together. 
even though we can't see one another. But we'd like to do something about that. So wherever you are right now, if you wouldn't mind pulling out an extra device, whatever you're not watching this service on, and click a selfie of you and where whoever else you're watching it with. We want to see who is worshiping with us and where you're worshiping from. So you can text it or email it to one of us pastors or in the chat room right now, there will be an email address for you to send it to so that we can see one another as we gather for worship in this space throughout the weeks ahead. I invite you now to prepare your hearts as we sing together, as we are reminded of good words together, and as we worship together. Would you join with us? Say that I need you. I lift my heart to 
say that I love you. I give my life, God, I am forever yours. So let your will be done in me. Let your kingdom come. of uh... 
pray together. Lord, you are faithful. We believe that you are the God who has and is and will make all things new. And so we trust and ask that you who began a good work in us and among us and around us would bring it to completion. Lord, we love you. Amen. Today we are not gathering in the same physical space, but we are gathering. The words will be on your screen, so I invite you to say your part out loud, so we can all know we're saying them together. We gather here to tell the truth. We don't have our lives together. And on our own, we can't get them together. We confess that we are poor, and we are hungry and thirsty for what we cannot provide ourselves. We need God's grace, and we need each other. We gather here to tell the truth, that while we were still sinners, God died in solidarity with us. And now you and I are forgiven, set free, and adopted into a good family. You and I are not alone. We belong to God and to one another. We are God's people, people who are rich and satisfied, a people of peace, reconciliation, and love. So today we gather here to tell the truth. Our lives are better when we are neighbors. We are not all the same, but we are all ready for transformation. We gather here to tell the truth. We will be a spiritual community of hope and transformation that lives the way of Jesus. Right now, we are practicing being good neighbors even as we take on the challenges of social distancing in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. But we want to make sure that the distance does not create isolation. So for the next three minutes, we're going to practice being good neighbors by checking in with at least one other person. As always, we want to remember to include our kids in this especially now as they are away from their friends. You can send a message to a kid through his or her parent, or if you don't have their parent's contact, send it to Pastor Hope. So with these things in mind, let's take a second to ask God to give you a name or two to check in with right now. If a person comes to mind that you do not have contact information for, you can send it to Pastor Chris or Pastor Mikhail, and they will pass it on. Now, for the next three minutes, write a short message expressing that this person is on your mind. Ask how they're doing, and how you can be praying for and or supporting them right now. Everyone ready to practice being good neighbors? Okay, go!
So one of the things that we are finding a new way to do is tell each other stories. And so each week we will hear a story from um, an individual or a family in our congregation through video. And we invite you to look for the good, both in the story that you hear and allow the stories that we hear to be invitations for us to look for the good in our own homes, in our own stories. And if you would like to volunteer to tell a story from your home during this time through video, contact me and I will help you with uh, what needs to happen and get it set up to go. So our storytellers for this week are the Gately family and I invite you to lean in to what is good as you hear their story. Hi, I'm Sherry. I'm Jason. I'm Jada. I'm John. Um, how we've been spending this time during quarantine just has been um, lots of together time. Um, <laughs> sort of thing sounds funny. Um, <laughs> we've been, <laughs> we've been trying. I'm Sherry. I'm Kristen. I'm Sheldon. I'm Josh. We're the Gateleys, and we're here because life is better when we are neighbors. Um, the last two weeks have been pretty interesting. Um, the first week, I think, was not really that crazy because we were on spring break anyways, and so it kind of seemed a little bit normal um, to be at home. But now that we are heading into week two and trying to figure out how we're going to do school and do life, <laughs> things have gotten a little bit crazier, um, and we're trying to adjust and find things that we find joy in that also keep us from going crazy and feeling like we are locked in our house. So we've been doing lots of bike rides, walks, playing outside, um, working in the yard, those sorts of things. My job is starting to provide a little bit of structure um, that has been helpful for me um, and having meetings and stuff like that as we work toward going to distance learning for our kiddos. So that has been something that at least has provided me a sense of normalcy. Um, Josh will share his experience here in just a minute. Can you tell us something that you've enjoyed doing while we're home together? What have you enjoyed? You don't know? What have you enjoyed doing? Playing the water slide. Oh, we got to play <laughs> on the water slide yesterday because it was really warm outside. Yeah, What's something that you really missed? Griffin misses his teacher. What do you miss? Mama and Papa. Jordan misses seeing Mama and Papa. <laughs> Josh? Um, it's been pretty interesting for me, like a lot of people. Um, my job completely came to a halt when, when everything started being canceled. Um, I'm a sports photographer, and everything through, through the summer that was on my calendar uh, got wiped clean. So I've just been kind of trying to figure out ways to stay busy. Um, keep taking pictures. I started a deal the first day we were in quarantine, and I, I've just been taking pictures of what the boys have been up to, what we've been up to as a family. Um, just as something for people to look at, for us to look back on um, when all this is over. Um, but other than that, you know, just just hanging out with family, um, hoping things get back to normal at some point, so we can all get back to normal. Um, but that's that's about it. People have been good neighbors to us by um, continuing to check in on us, our parish group. We've tried to maintain some normalcy there. Um, we had our first virtual parish group this last week, and that was very much needed and good to see people virtually. Um, but there's just been lots of thoughtful prayer and um, connection that way the best that we can do it but that has been important and needed um, also so that's really kind of what we have been doing is lots lots of craziness lots of together time <laughs> lots of together time so that's it that's the gateways during stop quarantine it. stop <laughs> it stop <laughs> it <laughs> Uh, 
love. Thank you, Josh and Sherry and Jordan and Griffin, um, for sharing your story with us. We enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I want to give us a moment now to respond um, in giving. This is something that we do each week as we gather for worship. And even though we're not here passing baskets, there are still ways for you to give. And you can find an online giving option on our website. You can also text to give or write out a check and mail it in. But I want to give us a moment to do that right now um, so that we can practice this um, this gift of generosity that we have to give to God and, and to share with one another. And while we do that, I just want to draw your attention to announcements. As you're watching online, there is a box down below the viewing screen that has announcements for us. And you can also find all the information that you need in our newsletter that goes out through email a couple times a week and on social media. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. If you feel like you should be getting the emails but you are not, let us know. You may also check your spam folder because sometimes Gmail has opinions about us, I guess. I don't know. So uh, I would invite you to now join me in prayer as we continue in worship together and find whatever prayer posture works for you in your own home, in your own space. But um, let's join our hearts together in prayer. So holy God, we come to you through <laughs> time and space and we recognize that you can draw us together from everywhere wh that we are and we are grateful. We ask Lord that as we are continued to as we continue to be confronted with the realities of a global pandemic that you would bring healing to your people that you would bring peace, that you would bring justice and calm, that you would make strong, weak hands and feeble knees, that you would say to those who are faint of heart, be strong and take courage. We ask this especially for those who are sick for those who are providing medical care, and for each of us who are trying to figure out what this new normal looks like. I ask, Lord, that you would give each of us eyes to see the new options, the new possibilities, the new yeses that lie in front of us, even amongst the midst of so many no's that we encounter. Open our eyes to see things as you see them. And enable us to walk in your way, in courage, in grace, and with peace. And we pray these prayers together with the saints. And we ask that Christ be in our mind, that we may see what is true that Christ be in our mouths, that we may speak with power, that Christ be in our hearts, that we may learn to be loved, that Christ be in our hands, that we may work with tenderness, that Christ be in our souls, that we may know our own desires. And we ask that Christ be in our arms, that we may reach without fear, Christ, be in our face that we may shine with God. And we ask these things in the name and the spirit of Christ our Lord. Amen. My home office uh, and I am excited to be able to join my church, 8th Street, uh, this week online. Uh, and I've been given uh, the privilege of reading the scripture text for this week. And so uh, today I'll be reading Philippians 1, 1 through 11. Uh, hear these words. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. 
I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and the deacons. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Verse 3, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand that what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to greet you in the strong and the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Chris Pollock. I get to be one of the pastors of the 8th Street Church. And as Pastor Mikhail said earlier, we are in our fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. And this is a season of darkness, of suffering. It's a season by which we put aside things and limit, th limit ourselves with things so that we might hear and know our good God just a little bit better. Sir Francis Drake was an old sailor who lived from 1540 to 1596, and he said these words, that it is not the beginning, but the continuing of the same, until it be thoroughly finished, that yieldeth the true, gl true glory. Now that's a mouthful, so let me break it down. In other words, he's saying that greatness is not starting something. But it's actually the hard work of doing that thing over and over and over, being diligent with it until it's finally completed. That's when the greatness is revealed. It's in the work. The greatness is actually in the persistence, the fortitude. It's in the hard work. And Paul says to the Philippians that God, the God who started a good work in you, will stay diligent. He will be persistent in finishing what he started until it comes to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. This God is one who goes about starting things. And God is also a finisher, but in the meantime, even though God has started, and even though we await his finishing work, God is here at work, faithfully on the job, earnest to the task at hand, to do the work of restoring and renewing this creation. And his children within it. And I think that Paul has an unshakable confidence, an, Im an immovable resolve when it comes to this. This is a really interesting thing considering Paul's circumstances. He's now considered an enemy of the state. He's a traitor to his own religion, and he's been thrown into prison. Paul's setting is in prison, and it is from that dark prison, that dark dungeon that he writes this letter to his friends in the church at Philippi. This church is one of his favorite churches, and you can feel the joy that he writes within this text, which makes me really curious about Paul's experience in prison. Now, I've never been to prison, but I've visited a number of people in prison. I've toured prisons, and things just don't seem that great. Unlike the office episode where the employees of Dunder Mifflin compare their work environment to prison and conclude that prison is actually better than their office, prison is actually quite terrifying. All scholars agree that Roman prisons were even more terrifying and even more difficult than the ones that we have here in North America. One college professor was making reference to Paul's time in prison. 
And he was able to talk about Roman prisons. He was able to talk about the nuances of prison. But then a student interrupted him and said, you don't know anything about prison. You've never been in prison. I know what prison is like. I was there for three days. And it was a lifetime. Paul tells us a little bit of his trials in prison. He says that he experiences one sorrow after another. We know that he was a small business owner as a tent maker. And when he goes to prison, he's unable to make any money. In Roman prisons, the captors didn't provide food. And in fact, a Roman prison was the extreme expression of social distancing. It forced Paul out of work and actually into starvation. In the first century, you didn't go to prison as a punishment like you do here and now if you're being punished and you need to make your, you pay the price that you, your debts to society. You were sent to prison so that you could, so they could decide what was going to happen to you. And so Paul sat in that dungeon, in that prison, and he's facing a death penalty sentence there. He's sitting on death row. But when you read the letter to the Philippians, it does not sound like someone who is, who's sitting on death row. It doesn't sound like a letter from a person who's experiencing such hardship. The spirit of the letter actually sounds like, it sounds like a, it, it's come from a kid who's writing his parents about an ex, a spiritual experience that he's had at summer camp. Now, Paul never pretends that things are easy for him or the Philippians or for Christians in general. But he does understand that his own experience there, even in that prison, represents a deeper worldwide anxiety. He knows the world is a hostile and uncompromising place. And he writes about that. So I I ask myself the question, how can one who is going through such hardship have this kind of attitude? How can he relish in his new reputation as a prisoner He actually says he takes pride in that. Nobody would ever want to be known as a jailbird. In that day and in this day, to have red marks on your record actually prevents you from every opportunity that most people are afforded except for the opportunity of being a slave. And all through the letter, Paul says things like this, rejoice with me. He says it again, rejoice. He says it again, rejoice. How how can he experience this kind of joy? At the end of Philippians, when he's done, he writes, feel the joy I'm feeling right now. What makes this life so great that it's worth celebrating? Well, I think that Paul can write this because he is able to see something that others cannot. Through the resurrected King Jesus, God is is in the middle of completing what he started. And that is where greatness is. And Paul says the Philippians, this holy community that cares for one another and provides for one another and provides for him and loves one another and loves him so well, that is the evidence of the truth that he believes in. So Paul is charged in love with this holy community and and he calls them to see differently as he sees differently. And he calls them to see differently and then to live as a unique kind of community in the face of a really hostile society. Now, Paul has learned by God's spirit to reorder the way he, th- he sees things and the way he thinks about things. Sure, he is, he is limited in his prison. Everybody in prison is. But Paul sees these limitations actually as the tools that God uses to go to work and finish what he started. So could this be a deeper truth for us here and now in this strange situation we find ourselves? Could, I don't know, maybe it be good that our limitations, I don't know, be something that God uses? A a pay cut, social distancing, the isolation that some of us feel, a sickness? being left out of a graduation or, or separation from friends, could these limitations be the very tools that the God who is doing a great work will use for his glory and his purposes 
and for our sake and the sake of others as he, through King Jesus, remakes and restores this very broken and this very sick world. It might be hard for us to imagine while we sit in our prisons separated from one another, but creating new in the midst of limitation it's actually happened before. So when I was in art school, I developed a shake in my hand and this was the straightest line I could draw. Now in hindsight, it was actually good for some things like mixing a can of paint or shaking a Polaroid. But at the time, this was really doomsday. This was, this was the destruction of my dream of becoming an artist. The shake developed out of really a single-minded pursuit of pointillism, just years of making tiny, tiny dots. And eventually, these dots went from being perfectly round to looking more like tadpoles because of the shake. So to compensate, I'd hold the pen tighter, and this progressively made the shake worse, so I'd hold the pen tighter still. And this became a vicious cycle that ended up causing so much pain and joint issues, I had trouble holding anything. And after spending all my life wanting to do art, I left art school, and then I left art completely. But after a few years, I just couldn't stay away from art, and I decided to go to a neurologist about the shake and discovered I had permanent nerve damage. And <laughs> he actually took one look at my squiggly line and said, well, why don't you just embrace the shake? So I did. I went home, I grabbed a pencil, and I just started letting my hand shake and shake. I was making all these scribble pictures. And even though it wasn't the kind of art that I was ultimately passionate about, it felt great. And more importantly, once I embraced the shake, I realized I could still make art. I just had to find a different approach to making the art that I wanted. Now, I, I still enjoyed the fragmentation of pointillism, seeing these little tiny dots come together to make this unified whole. So I began experimenting with other ways to fragment images where the shake wouldn't affect the work, like dipping my feet in paint and walking on a canvas. Or in a 3D structure consisting of two by fours, creating a 2D image by burning it with a blowtorch. I discovered that if I worked in a larger scale with bigger materials, my hand really wouldn't hurt. And after having gone from a single approach to art, I ended up having an approach to creativity that completely changed my artistic horizons. This was the first time I'd encountered this idea that embracing the limitation could actually drive creativity. At the time, I was finishing up school and I was so excited to get a real job and finally afford new art supplies. I had this horrible little set of tools and you know, I, I felt like I could do so much more with the supplies I thought an artist was supposed to have. I actually didn't even have a regular pair of scissors. I was using these metal shears until I stole a pair from the office that I worked at. So I got out of school, I got a job, I got a paycheck, I got myself to the art store, and I just went nuts buying supplies. And then when I got home, I sat down and I set myself the task to really try to create something just completely outside of the box. But I sat there for hours, and nothing came to mind. The same thing the next day, and then the next quickly slipping into a creative slump. And I was in a dark place for a long time, unable to create. And it didn't make any sense because I was finally able to support my art, and yet I was creatively blank. But as I searched around in the darkness, I realized I was actually paralyzed by all of the choices that I never had before. And it was then that I thought back to my jittery hand and braced the shake. And I realized if I ever wanted my creativity back, I, I had to quit trying so hard to think outside of the box and get back into it. I wondered, could you become more creative then by looking for limitations? What if I could only create with a dollar's worth of supplies? At this point, I was spending a lot of my evenings in, well, I guess I still spend a lot of my evenings in Starbucks, but I, I know you can ask for an extra cup if you want one. So I decided to ask for 50. Surprisingly, they just handed them right over, and then with some pencils I already had, I made this project for only 80 cents. It really became a moment of clarification for me that we need to first be limited in order to become limitless. 
I took this approach of thinking inside the box to my canvas and wondered what if instead of painting on a canvas, I could only paint on my chest. <laughs> so I painted 30 images, one layer at a time, one on top of another, with each picture representing an influence in my life. Or what if instead of painting with a brush, I could only paint with karate chops? <laughs> so I dipped my hands in paint and I just, I just attacked the canvas and I actually hit so hard that I bruised a joint in my pinky and it was stuck straight for a couple weeks. <laughs> or what if, what if instead of relying on myself, I had to rely on other people to create the content for the art? So for six days, I lived in front of a webcam, I slept on the floor, and I ate takeout. And I asked people to call me and share a story with me about a life-changing moment. Their stories became the art as I wrote them onto the revolving canvas. <laughs> or what if instead of making art to display, I had to destroy it? This seemed like the ultimate limitation, being an artist without art. This destruction idea turned into a year-long project that I called Goodbye Art, where each and every piece of art had to be destroyed after its creation. In the beginning of Goodbye Art, I focused on forced destruction, like this image of Jimi Hendrix, made with over 7,000 matches. <laughs> then I opened it up to creating art that was destroyed naturally. I looked for temporary materials, like spitting out food, sidewalk chalk, and even frozen wine. The, the last iteration of destruction was to try to produce something that didn't actually exist in the first place. So I organized candles on a table, I lit them and then blew them out, then repeated this process over and over with the same set of candles, then assembled the videos into the larger image. So the end image was never visible as a physical whole. It was destroyed before it ever existed. In the course of this Goodbye Art series, I created 23 different pieces with nothing left to physically display. What I thought would be the ultimate limitation actually turned out to be the ultimate liberation, as each time I created, the destruction brought me back to a neutral place where I felt refreshed and ready to start the next project. It didn't. It did not happen overnight. <laughs> there were times when my projects failed to get off the ground, or even worse, after spending tons of time on them, the end image was kind of embarrassing. But having committed to the process, I continued on, and something really surprising came out of this. As I destroyed each project, I was learning to let go. Let go of outcomes, let go of failures, and let go of imperfections. And in return, I found a process of creating art that's perpetual and unencumbered by results. I found myself in a state of constant creation, thinking only of what's next and coming up with more ideas than ever. When I, I think back to my three years away from art, away from my dream, just going through the motions, instead of trying to find a different way to continue that dream, I just quit. I gave up. And what if I didn't embrace the shape? Because embracing the shape for me wasn't just about art and having art skills. It turned out to be about life and having life skills. Because ultimately, most of what we do takes place here, inside the box with limited resources. Learning to be creative within the confines of our limitations is the best hope we have to transform ourselves and collectively transform our world. Looking at limitations as a source of creativity changed the course of my life. Now when I run into a barrier or I find myself creatively stumped, I sometimes still struggle, but I, I continue to show up for the process and try to remind myself of the possibilities, like using hundreds of real live worms to make an image, <laughs> using a pushpin to tattoo a banana, or painting a picture with hamburger grease. <laughs> One of my most recent endeavors is to try to translate the habits of creativity that I've learned into something others can replicate. Limitations may be the most unlikely of places to harness creativity, but perhaps one of the best ways to get ourselves out of ruts, 
briefing categories and challenge accepted norms. And instead of telling each other to seize the day, maybe, we can remind ourselves every day to seize the limitations. Thank you. I think this is what Paul can see. He knows there in that prison he is limited. And he was locked up because the powers that be thought that the limits and the chains they put on him would stop a great movement. But like Phil Hansen, this artist, he learned that his limitation actually led to his liberation. He knows that death is on the way, but for Paul, he can see something that others can't see. He, he knows that death, the greatest of limitations, the greatest, the greatest shake, we could say, is what he actually embraces because he trusts that God's work becomes limitless, even in the limited. So Paul invites the Philippians, and now us, to open our eyes and see the God who is in the middle of a great work, and he invites us to open our eyes and look deep into our own limitations, the fear, the social distancing, the hardship of a cut paycheck, maybe even sickness, maybe even death. Paul invites us to even look at those things and see the opportunities, the possibilities of a whole new world that God is making through his son Jesus. Just yesterday, I received an email from Pastor Mikhail as she was seeing the same sorts of things in this text that I was. She wrote to me and she said, you know that saying that every yes is a no to something and that every no is a yes to something else? This morning in my own prayer time, I felt the question rise up. What is the big yes rising up in the midst of the no's? All these cancellations, these closed doors and disruptions about the way things were allowing, is, is allowing for something or, or things that could have happened before. There could be new possibilities, new opportunities, new gifts. But it requires restraining and reframing, for me at least, to see it this way. And then to receive the new things. I replied back to her, Mikhail, that I think is exactly what Paul is saying to the Philippians. Some, sometimes a no means a greater, fuller, more lively yes. A yes to an opportunity, yes to good news, yes to creativity, yes to neighborliness, yes to a more full, lively, rich humanity. And, and sometimes it's only in times of stress and sickness and suffering, it's in times of limitation, only in times of limitation that we're introduced to this whole new reality that is presented to us by King Jesus himself. And during this season of Lent, the season where we limit ourselves to see new things, that the truth, it's only in this season that the truth of our world and the lack of power and all of the other gods is being revealed. I've been thinking about this a lot, especially regarding the very narrow view. This is one example, but the, especially regarding the very narrow view that we have with the economy. For us, a thriving economy is the great God, the powerful provider for us all. Watching CNN or those presidential press conferences brings me nothing but fear and anxiety. But as a Christian, I need to watch that news, but hold that news up against the message of Paul to the Philippians. The president and others are worried about the economy, as am I. And there's reasons to be. People's jobs are at stake. But governors and, and senators are also worried. And on some level, business leaders have to tighten their belt because they're worried. As a global community, we're in a crisis. But this crisis has actually done something. It's revealed a deeper truth that we have ignored. And that is this, that the kingdoms of this world are just not sustainable. They're capable for prosperity for a little bit of time and for a certain 
group of people, but when push comes to shove and worry steps in, when the Dow numbers drop, the whole thing falls apart, and it falls apart fast. We've seen this happen. People are being harangued. They're, they're, let, go of, uh, they're let, re- let go regardless of how many years they were on the job. They're forced to take pay cuts to make millionaires and billionaires more money. To say that we want churches packed on Easter is a religious statement. But a statement like that is not about the resurrected Christ or the hope for our own resurrection. It's actually about resurrecting an unstable, feeble, worn out economic system that's been around since the Pharaohs. And what we have here is a matter of worship, idolatry worship. And our worship is being revealed. If the sustainability of our lives is dependent on an economic projection that's put together by Wall Street or business leaders, politicians, or even us, the consumer, the consumers, then no wonder those in charge have been suggesting that the economy is what we should give our very lives to or the lives of our elderly, as some, as some have suggested this week. It's been suggested that we bow to the altar of these gods because this is what we should worship, which we must confess we have done. And, and the suggestion is that we need to yield ourselves to this economic structure and to say that this is the God that provides for us. You notice, maybe, that this is exactly what Jesus was tempted to do when he went into the wilderness. The devil, whatever the devil looks like, said to him, jump off the temple, because glory comes from the temple, the White House, the Capitol, the governor's mansion. He was tempted, turn those stones into bread, worship the God of provision, and we do that because we say, how will I eat if I do not have a job? Or bow down to the one who can give all the kingdoms of this world. The gods of major corporations say this all the time. But God, God, the God of Jesus, says no. And the reason he says no is so that a new yes can be said. This is what Paul is introducing to the Philippians. And he's introducing to us. He's inviting us into a new way of seeing things, a new thought pattern. We're welcome to come out of our blindness and into a place of light. And frankly, it's only in times like the ones we have now, these days when we're in serious limitation, where we're we're limited, that we can differentiate between the truth that infills us by Jesus himself and the lies that surround us. This is what we call the gospel. Now, the gospel isn't just doctrinal statements we believe or adhere to, but Paul and others believe that the gospel is actually this this energy that is making its way out into the world, and Christians become partners with one another and with God as, as we do the great and glorious work of, as we do the great and glorious work of that one, and Paul says we get to participate in it. That's why... Paul says that he is glad that he has partners in the gospel and that the Philippians are partners in the gospel. Partner is a great word that we hold close. In the Greek, it means, in the Greek, the translation is koinonia, and it means a Christian community that shares in the energy of that good news, the gospel. Now, Paul knows that God's kingdom has been inaugurated. And Jesus has taken his place as the royal Messiah, who is indeed the Lord of the whole world. But he asks, what does this mean for his followers? Well, Paul says, now you can think differently. You get to be a different kind of people. You are now a different kind of people that views the world differently, that sees limitations as opportunities, and you get to be the kind of people that view your own humanity as something that is beautiful and wonderful and good. Because no's in God actually mean a new God yes, I want to give us an opportunity to think first about our limitations and then think about how God is doing a new yes in us. So I have several questions that I want you to think through and maybe even talk about there in your living rooms or wherever you're watching. But the first question is this. How 
do we see things in new ways? Even as we're limited, where is the no in our lives? Now a new God, yes. What do our limitations provide for us that our freedoms never could? How can we seize the limitation? The place where we are, the cut paychecks, the worry, the fear, the isolation from others. How can we embrace that shake? Do we believe that in being limited, there's actually an opportunity in God to become limitless? Because Paul did. Do we trust that like Paul, our limitations are the tools that God uses to change us and change the course of our world? Could embracing the limitations that we have actually usher in a divine creativity so that we can find a way to be that community, that koinonia, that Christian community, so that we might be able to love and serve and be the kind of community that we're called to be? As a resurrection people, people who know that we're not limited by death, that our God is not limited by death, do we trust that our ultimate limitation could become the tool that God uses to drive us into our ultimate liberation? How does this prison that we find ourselves in, these, these limitations we're in now, how does the fear and the isolation that surrounds us how is it going to be used to be, to be used in a redemptive way that brings glory to God and is good for us and good for our neighbor? How will the God who in Jesus began the good work bring it to completion in us? Until the final day of Christ Jesus, when all things are made new, this is the great and glorious work that God is doing now, inviting us to see things anew, inviting us to think in new ways, inviting us to recognize that indeed Jesus is Lord of all. And this is what is happening in us today. He will finish what he has started, but in the, in the meantime, how will we see in new ways so that we can confirm the God yes? In fact, indeed, it is well with my soul.
So each week we are invited to take these words of Jesus into our lives with a weekly practice. And so this week we are invited to continue the practice of last week of looking for signs of life and take that one step further. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in partnership with the God who is at work remaking all things, offer signs of life to others. Through the limitations that we experience, Look for ways that God may be leading us to love one another well, to be good neighbors, and to join in his work of recreation. You'll find a weekly practice in your inbox on Monday, and you can follow along on social media, where we also invite you to share about your weekly practice experiences there as well. Before we sing our final act of worship together through a song, I invite you to receive these words of benediction. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you. May the Lord protect you. And may the Lord give you peace. Amen.